All right, all right, all right. <clears throat> Let's get fired up here. Maximum freedom. Read. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Read Rothbard. <laughs> hey, and welcome to the inaugural episode of the Actual Anarchy Podcast. My name is Daniel, and I have a co-host with me. His name is Robert. Robert Johnson. And welcome to the show. Energy. Energy. We're doing it. We're doing this. I just watched Best in Show last night, so I've got a couple. Ah, good stuff. Energy. Hosting the show. Fired up. Brand new show. Brand new attitude. We're radical dude. Oh, God. I should just stop talking. Yeah, so you, uh, you folks may know us from the Reed Rothbard podcast. Uh, we're still affiliated. We still run it. Uh, we've transitioned that over to audiobooks. Uh, so voice actors reading Marie Rothbard books. So that'll still be posting every week. We also run Enemy of the State podcast. And that's Marie Rothbard Lectures. And now we have this new podcast, which is now going to be called the Actual Anarchy Podcast. And the premise is this. We're going to continue doing what we have been doing where we talk about movies and news events. And how we do it is, is we watch a movie, we give a synopsis, and then we point out some situations where uh, there's a lesson of the non-aggression principle or violations thereof. We talk about the morality of situations or if there's a, an economics point that we want to make, we'll do that within the movie. And it's essentially actual instances of anarchy. Like any time that a decision is made by individuals in a voluntary fashion, that's anarchy. That's 90% of what you do every day. Um, so that's the point of the podcast. We're showcasing actual instances of anarchy, and we're also promoting the idea that this is what anarchy actually is. It's not going around wearing black and red and smashing up Starbucks windows like they're doing right now in Washington, D.C. Right. And, in case you're listening to this at a later point, we're actually recording this on Inauguration Day of the what, 45th uh, Supreme Dictator uh, of the uh, United States, um, Donald J. Trump. And there's been a fair amount of lefty county types that are losing their shit about it. Yeah, and the liberals and the mainstream media are all about it, apparently. Like, there's marches and protests planned in almost any city of any significant size, like even nearby. Here, a, a town of like 40,000 people, there's going to be a, a march tomorrow. It's some uh, women's march against Trump, and it's all about Planned Parenthood and women's quote-unquote rights. And uh, it's it's ridiculous what what people think are due to them these days, like what they're entitled to. And so that's what we're going to talk about is what anarchy actually means, what it actually is, and dissect movies and news events. So this is kind of a long roundabout way of talking about it. And we're going to talk a little bit about the inauguration and Trump and Hillary and how terrible that whole situation is as well. Um, but we're, you know, this is kind of a feel it out episode, get you guys acquainted with what we do. And if, if you want, uh, We've been doing this for some time now, about eight or nine months. And so feel free to go back and review the first 40 episodes of the Reed Rothbard podcast, and you'll get a flavor for what we do. Uh, going forward, um, Reed Rothbard, like I said, is going to be audiobooks, and we're going to do the movie review stuff here on Actual Lantern. Yeah, and uh, we feel the need to do this because we don't go around smashing things. Um, smashing things tends to attract attention, it tends to get headlines, so that's basically what people understand anarchy to be, these black-wearing, 
anarchists who go around breaking things. That's what they associate the term. You don't see the anarchist who's calmly minding his own business, sitting by, you know, doing his own thing, not bothering anybody. That, that's, that's not a, that's not a fire. It doesn't, it doesn't bleed, so it doesn't lead. So you don't really hear about it. So you may not, you may not be as familiar with it as you are the, uh, Black flag waving, uh, everything's oppressing me. Down with, um, down with the evil capitalist pig uh, anarchists that uh, people that claim to be anarchists that you see on the evening news. Yeah, they're really just going around and, and ruining the reputation of anarchy. Which, when you really break it down to what anarchy is, it just means without rulers or without uh, you know an authority over you. And the lefty communist type anarchists will also add in it means no hierarchy and Robert we can touch on this a little bit but no hierarchy is basically saying that no one can be the boss of anyone else so let's say I hire the kid down the street to mow my lawn that's not permitted Uh, and he's not allowed to own a lawnmower and mow other people's lawn right because then it becomes means of production instead of personal property whereas he can mow his own lawn with it except he can't actually own any property, so he can't own a lawn to mow. You, you see where I'm going with this? Like, their system doesn't make any sense. It could never function, and well, it would also, require a lot of... Uh, uh, it would require somebody to enforce these arbitrary rules and distinctions. So, therefore, by de facto, they would have a government. And it also seems to be this kind of infantile mindset where everybody is oppressing you and everything is oppressing you at all times. Like it's some sort of like nature is this hierarchy, like you're being oppressed by scarcity and you can't form voluntary relationships where one person can tell one person, another person to do something because that's evil hierarchy. Uh, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And when you actually put it into practice, it doesn't work. It's been proven throughout history not to work. It leads to horrors and inefficiency and just waste and loss and death. And we can get into that, and we will, but that's not the main focus of the show. But um, we mainly talk about movies and pop culture and applying the map to different situations. But um, right now, in this uh, first inaugural episode... Uh, maybe we can get in, talk about a little bit. Yeah, so you just threw out another term there that if people aren't familiar with us, they might not know what it is. So the NAP is the non-aggression principle. And essentially what it is, it means that it, it's a it's a rule of conduct that is acceptable to most everyone. And if everyone did it, then it wouldn't violate anyone else. So... It's a premise that is um, one that would not inflict uh, violence or fraud against anyone else. If everyone did it, there would be no, like, negative consequence necessarily of doing such. Versus any other form of um, control where you would necessarily be forcing someone to do something with either the threat of force or actual force. Right, and the communist says that, well... You're oppressing me by forcing me to participate in the market in order to feed myself because there's enough food to go around and I'm perfectly entitled to it because I exist, not because I actually worked to create any of it. It's a really weird philosophy. (laughs) Yeah, it seems to stem from this idea that um, because they're alive, someone else owes it to them. Right. Versus just somebody voluntarily, like, in a charity sense, like, looking out for their fellow man, which I think a lot of people would do, especially if they have a lot of, uh, you know, savings or capital accumulated. Like, if their standard of, standard of living is, is sufficient to where they're comfortable, then it's easier for them to focus on helping others. But if you're scratching by day to day, uh, you know, like, human history has gone back, what, five, ten thousand years recorded history, and... Through 99% of that, starvation, death, uh, poverty, like, was the human condition. 
And it's only in the last couple of hundred years where people have been able to save and put things towards capital and towards improvements in agricultural technologies, manufacturing technologies, factories, the Industrial Revolution, to where goods and services that used to be reserved only for kings are now available to, to everyday people. You know, the, the lap of luxury that I live in right now, and I am by no means a rich person, but in contrast to the 99% of human history, I am living greater than the greatest emperors and kings of old, by far. By far. You have magic devices that display information at your fingertips, at your slightest whim. You have hot water on command. You have frozen ice and delectable sugars and sugary sweets. You have transportation options that never existed in history. You could fly around the world and have things delivered to you from all the corners of the world, see amazing sights and sounds. The, live, the world we live in is unfathomably rich compared to people of just a few hundred years ago, the richest among us of just a few hundred years ago, who, if you wanted to go across the Atlantic, first of all, you m probably wouldn't make it, and it would take months of your life. Yeah, exactly. So we sort of touched on what anarchy actually is. It just means no rulers. It doesn't mean no hierarchy. Uh, we've talked about the non-aggression principle which basically means you have uh, every right to defend yourself, but to commit force or fraud against someone else is, is uh, a violation, and uh, people should be able to respond accordingly. And uh, another thing that we talked about is Austrian economics, which, in my view, is a uh, more accurate depiction of human interaction. Um, Mises wrote a great treatise called Human Action. I mean, anything that is visible in an economy is actually the result of humans acting, exchanging with each other, uh, and then there's of course, you know, influences from third parties and others, like government and regulations and things that distort uh, voluntary transactions and interactions. Um, that always leads to negative consequences. Uh, Bastiat talked about the seen and the unseen, and uh, a lot of times government intervention will appear on its face uh, to be doing something to help a certain group of people. But what's unseen is all of the costs that were involved and the things that were not able to happen because of those interventions. So we do a lot of argument uh, in that respect where we believe that voluntary interactions, people looking out for their own best interest, their best interest is to provide value to someone else. Like no one can survive necessarily on their own. Like uh, we'll get painted with a brush, being libertarians that we are, of wanting to be left alone and not exchange uh, with anyone else, with community, with society, with anything. And that actually can't uh, grow. Like, if, if everyone was solely responsible for their own food, housing, shelter, uh, you know, entertainment, uh, you know, anything, anything you can think of, we would have to be marginally good at many different things and we could never be great and so we'd be we'd be back to that scratching by existence of, of ancestors right and even even one of the great libertarian novels of our time probably the greatest i would argue or one of the greatest at least entertainment novels atlas shrugged which is derided as being the greatest taking my ball and going home kind of pouty whiny libertarian Nonsense is what he says what the, the lefties call it. Um, the libertarians, the, the people that wanted freedom from all these horrific government regulations and theft didn't just go off on their own. They moved to a place called Galt's Gulch and they lived with other like-minded people and they formed a community there where each specialized in a thing. There was a banker and there was a miner and they did all these different jobs that they specialized in and they brought value to each other and they built this community free of this these this violent intrusion of these violent thugs and i i saw it as a wonderful thing I, it was bizarre reading any kind of criticisms of it saying that it was oh, i don't know like pretentious and pouty and whiny and not wanting to play with others it was absolutely wanting to play with others it just wasn't wanting to play with 
other violent kids. Like, why would you want to play with the bully? You'd want to play with your friends. You found value in. I don't think anybody complains that people don't want to play with the bullies. Yeah, indeed. Like, the the whole idea of, of living a free life is to not have bullies that have a... Uh, alleged legitimate claim to be bullies. Like, whenever you bow to authority, then those in authority will take that as permission to do terrible things to you. Right. And it's this belief in authority that creates this, uh, I don't know, I, I want to say a throne of power that people will ascend to or attempt to gain. And even if it's your, you know, local, like, I don't know, in high school you had kind of the dumb jock kind of guys who you knew weren't super smart, they weren't going to get very far in life. And oftentimes they'll be the ones who would become like the prison guards or the police officers, things like that. And it's because they can grab at some of that authority over others, some of that power over others. And politicians are much the same way, they're just a little bit slicker at it. You know, they, they know how to say the right things to get uh, enough votes in a popularity contest every couple of years. And all of it's illegitimate, of course. Um, the only legitimate authority is yourself. Who owns you? You know, does someone else own you? Do you own you? I'd argue you own yourself. And some people will shout back, well, we're all part of the human family. So we're all one seven billionth or one eight billionth uh, joint ownership of each other. But think about that in a practical aspect. Like, do you make decisions on your own? Or do you wait for seven or eight billion other people to vote on whether you can, you know, eat a Pop-Tart. Yeah, it's ridiculous to say that it's, it's, it's something like when, when Obama said, you know, you didn't do that, you didn't get there on your own, other people helped you do that. Well, other people contributed and create to the market, absolutely, because they create value, because they want to make a profit. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we all own each other. Just because we're all contributing to the general welfare of, like, if you want to call it society, by participating in the market, by providing value to each other voluntarily, that doesn't then follow that we all own each other and we can all tell each other what to do, that we can act with coercion and violence on each other. We naturally are repulsed from violence, and rightfully so. We recognize it as wrong, and we reject it, and we cheer for the defender. And that's all the NAP is. It does, it's not the no violence principle. It's the no aggressive, aggressive violence principle. Yeah, indeed. Like, if everyone were allowed to aggress against everyone else, then it would be that, you know, the picture of anarchy that's in most people's heads, you know, the warlords fighting with each other with machine guns on the back of their Toyota pickups. But that's not a sustainable way of living. Obviously, like no one would be able to produce, no one would be able to save anything uh, in that environment. So we would be stagnant. We would be stuck at whatever level. And we would devolve, actually, like into a uh, state of chaos. And one of the one of the ideas is that violence is expensive, right? Like whenever you commit violence against someone else, if they are able to defend themselves, then you run that cost, that risk of perpetrating that violence. And right. so, you be hurt. You take your life in your own hands. Absolutely. All right, say that. Say that one more time, Robert. We had some weird uh, digitization for a moment there. Oh, I'll cut it out. I was just agreeing with you and noting that yes, you violence is expensive because there's the risk because you could be hurt. You take your life into your own hands when you risk taking the to the, the, the disagreement or whatever it is to a physical level. Right, and so voting is, is a way of diffusing that risk uh, and parceling it out to others so that, you know, you, you and your neighbors vote for someone else to go and rob someone else at gunpoint. Right, you're not actually doing it yourself physically. All you're doing is checking a box and you're having somebody else do it for you. It it makes the violence much less expensive, reduces the risk entirely to you, essentially, almost. 
So there's a lot more of it. If you reduce the cost of a thing, of a desired good, which is apparently violence in this world, <laughs> it's a desired good, because it happens all the time, and people are always voting for it, then yeah. But if you actually had to d- take it into your own hands, if there was no machination of government with which to wield against your neighbor, if you actually had to get a gun or whatever and go over and rob them personally, how often would you do it? Probably much less likely and much less often than you do by whining to some politician to do a thing. Indeed, and how often do politicians actually follow through on their promises? You know, and that's the that's the other thing about politics. Like it's such a divisive thing that they're going to say whatever they can to get your vote, and then they're not going to care. So they're going to, you know, do those attack ads and disparage another group of individuals who might vote for someone else. And that's the whole reason Trump actually won this this election was because Hillary put all the people against Trump and labeled them as racist, bigots, deplorable, terrible people. And, you know, what a better way to coalesce a group of resistance against you than to lump them all together in this terrible, awful, you know, slanderous way. Like, all the people who even supported him slightly would then turn and go, you know what, she is, she's being awful to us. She's calling us racist. We're not racist. She's calling us bigots. We're not bigots. Fuck her. You know? Right. And even if they were racist, even if someone was racist, calling someone racist doesn't get rid of the racism. So calling them a bunch of names isn't doesn't make you go, oh, oh I see your point. Oh, yeah. Man, I'm a terrible person. Maybe I should change. That's, that's not how that works. That's not how you win people to your side by name calling. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah, the, the way to combat racism is make it cost them economically. You like make it lose them customers. Make it, you know, let people choose what who they want to interact with. And if somebody is is openly racist, it's going to cost them opportunities for customers. That's right. Make them suffer the market cost. And that's how you do free market style. You don't put government regulations and create laws that say you can't discriminate this or that. First of all, that's thought police. But second of all, you want to know the people that discriminate against other people for whatever reason. It helps you make better decisions of where to spend your money. Do you really want to support the racist? Do you want to make him hide behind whatever, not letting you know that he's a racist? Or do you want his racism to be out front and to show it? And so then you can say, oh, now as an informed consumer... I'm going to choose not to support this person. I'd yeah, that's one, of the, that it's one of the topics we discussed on the final episode of uh, the Reed Rothbard podcast where we're talking about uh, Martin Luther King with uh, Ryan. And, yeah, it was, it was exactly that. You know, it was like, would you rather know somebody's intentions and, and their, th- you know, let, allow them to interact with people who they choose to interact with or not? You know, anytime you have a, a law that says, oh, you have to serve everybody, or you have to do this, or you have to do that, and it's enforced with, with a gun, essentially, then, you know, would you rather stick to... Yeah, know, how, how comfortable would you be? How comfortable would you be if you were that Jewish person, and you went to that Nazi baker, and you were like, bake me this cake for my wedding? Would you really feel comfortable eating that cake? I mean, would it really taste that good? Would you really... I don't know. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the inauguration because it is happening today. Uh, have you been oh, able yeah. to watch any of it or have you just been familiar with some of the rioting going on? I've just seen a couple of headlines. Um, there's a bunch of dire predictions. A bunch of people are saying, oh, no, look at Trump making all these promises. He's not going to be able to live up to these. And I just remember Obama talking about how he's going to end the war in Iraq and close down Guantanamo. And every politician ever who's made every promise to get elected and then never done a single one of them. So we'll see. Um, Trump is definitely the – he's kind of like a dark horse. I mean, he's a very much – even though he's an old white man, um, old white rich man, he's still very much an outsider, um, politically at least. Uh, but that doesn't mean necessarily anything. Uh, people are very different once they get in office when they're out of office usually before at least, 
after they've been in office, they're still that same douchebag. But, um, yeah, Trump has a lot of – he has some potential. But, I mean, you can't really expect anything good to come out of the political process. I and mean, the political process is violence. It is coercion. It is theft. So what do you expect from these thugs? Um, you can't expect anything good to come out of it, can you? Other than them shutting it down, closing down and repealing laws and that sort of thing, which is like incremental levels of freedom. Those are small quality of life issues, I suppose. I don't know, Daniel, yeah. what do you think of the inauguration? Well, I am seeing a lot of people still freaking out about it, like still saying like today that, that the world's ending and, and so they're going to protest and fight for women's rights or LGBT. TBQ trans rights and all of those things as if uh, he's literally the next Hitler and he's going to come in and put people in the camps. And yeah. it's, it's terrible how people are making it as divisive as it is. I mean, sure, that's the whole point of politics, but I think they're taking it a bit far. You know, there's always been disagreement in politics and we're never given good choices, really. Um, but to think they have this moral high ground to then go out and destroy things. And I, I don't know, I'm, I'm struggling with how to say this, but uh, this, in my lifetime, appears to be the most divided of any election and any yeah. inauguration. Uh, and, and, you know, it's probably further back than that. Right. And I would say that there seem to be some good things that are coming out of this, like the people that are saying, you know, the system failed. Not my president. I would say yes to both of those things, but not for the reasons you probably think. <laughs> I'd say it's all illegitimate, so none of these presidents are my president. Um, I was watching Braveheart recently, and William Wallace, you know, he fought against, um, I think it was Edward I, or I forget the name of the, uh, the king he was fighting against. But he was tried for treason, and he said, well, that's impossible. I've never been one of his subjects. <laughs> so, you know, I never, I never swore any loyalty to these people, these crooks, so you can't try me for treason. Um, so I hope, I hope that people are more disillusioned with the political process. I hope that they'll turn to anarchy as a means of which people do in their daily life, like we say over and over, 90% of your, 95% more, probably like 99% of your daily life is, spent in pure anarchic bliss. Um, but I worry that these lefties are really just control freaks and they are just upset that their that their person that they wanted didn't get into power because Trump says mean things about some people. <laughs> I think that's the takeaway that they've got from it. Uh, we'll see. But yeah, I, have, I, always... I have slight hope. We'll see. It always seems to be that, that they're upset about something that is taken out of context as well. I mean, yeah, sure, he's not the nicest guy around, and he's using the political process and therefore violence, but they twist a lot of what he says and take it out of context, and so they make it worse than it is, And that, which is kind of surprising. Like, usually politicians, like, try to sugarcoat shit, you know, and mm -hmm. people cover for them, like, when... Um, Obama did the exact same shit Bush was doing. You know, they'd been protesting yep. against Bush for eight years, and then Obama does the same shit for eight years, and they're yep. mum. They're mum about it, and now they're going to come out and and uh, be upset with Trump. And Trump's probably going to, I would imagine, scale back on a fair amount of it. He seems to, that's his rhetoric, is that he's going to scale back on a lot of the wars and all the murder, but uh, we'll see. Um, it's funny, I've been watching the headlines with the, the absolute disgusting love fest that is to the, uh, leaving Obama as if he was any kind of a decent person or human being, that he wasn't a mass murderer. All these people that were saying this is like the second Camelot and all oh, this disgusting authority worship from these lefties saying how Obama is just the greatest president ever and how honored they were and, and then with Trump coming in, who just has said some nasty words, I guess, and put things in mean ways, um, they hate him and think he's literally Hitler. 
But when you actually go out and murder a bunch of people, that's fine as long as you're a Democrat. Uh, you have this left cover to actually do things, but if you say things, then you're bad. But if you do things horrible, you're fine as long as you're a Democrat. It's the, the disconnect is so massive. It's being on the outside and looking at it. It's like, how do you not see that? That cognitive dissonance is like, it's so blatant. You know, the status mind baffles me now that I've been removed from it for a while now. Yeah, it it, it is weird how so long as your rhetoric is okay, your actions don't matter. Yeah. But if your rhetoric is like anything against that, uh, what Tom Woods calls the three by five card of opinion or what is it called? Allowable opinion. opinion. Yeah, allowable opinion. Then all of a sudden you're some kind of a monster. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you say the right things and then then you do monstrous acts. But if you say things that aren't on that little index card and then do things that are or are not monstrous, you are viewed as an awful, evil, terrible monster. Yeah, and it's funny. Trump, Trump has been providing value for how many years, how many decades, providing jobs, building buildings. But yet he's seen as this horrific monster. With all these supposed crimes, even though there were all these um, allegations by women of sexual impropriety or whatever that all disappeared mysteriously, um, probably means they were all bullshit. But what do I know? I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to really sit here and defend the guy. He's the president. He's the leader of the biggest pile of thugs in the world. So, but at the same time. You can't condemn the guy for things he hasn't done yet, um, necessarily. Uh, anyway. Yeah, but he's, you know, been the president for, what, uh, six hours now? So I'm sure he's already committed several, several actual crimes. Now it's, he's fair game. Absolutely. Now he's fair game. Now he's the, the leader. Now he's the thug in chief. So absolutely fair game. But when he was just saying things that people didn't like... What what happened to the left who were all about the free speech? What happened? Or is it just free speech that they agree with? Seems to be the case. With all the stupid social justice warriors and the safe spaces and all that bullshit. Yeah, like how much freedom is left in the amount of speech that they'll actually allow with their safe spaces and social justice? Like you have to watch your mouth so closely so that you don't even mildly, maybe if they twist what you say possibly offend somebody oh yeah and if you're like a, a professor at a college and you have a twitter account <laughs> just <laughs> be really really careful about saying anything about anybody at any time because you will get fired for that shit if someone takes offense you'll then you'll have the the college come in and say we don't we don't condone his comments regardless of what they were like, whatever happened to colleges being institutions of thought and learning <laughs> seem to be the days gone past. Yeah, and yet somehow I feel that when we were there, it was there was a modicum of that. There was still some debate going on and still some critical thinking. And granted, we were pretty lefty back then, so you know maybe it's just we didn't see it. And and if we were in that situation, uh, like if we could take our minds now and go back 20 years and put ourselves in those situations, I wonder if we would see it. Uh, worse than it was, or if it actually has devolved even further. I mean, yeah, like if, that's an interesting idea. Like I would if we love were to go, be able to do that. Yeah, like if we were able to go back to college today, knowing what we know now, versus 20 years ago when when we did actually go, but knowing what we know now, like how much different it would be. Right. Because yeah, going today, you know the kind of shitstorm you'd be walking into. I wonder what it would have been like 20 years ago. I wonder what it was like for the, you know, the anarchist libertarian back in the day to go to college because there weren't as many of them, but they did exist. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, a lot of the groundwork that, that was laid, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago is, is now bearing fruit, and we are the result of that. I mean, Murray Rothbard often had uh, meetings in his uh, living room. Like, they would just converse and talk about, like, somebody owns a gorilla and the gorilla smashes a window. 
Like, who's responsible for that? And he would have these kinds of debates and discussions. And all the anarchists in, in the, on the Eastern Seaboard would fit in his living room. There'd be like 10 of them. Yeah. Right. And then they'd all get together like a Radisson by the airport, all sitting in this smoky room. And they'd have like their little conventions. And they'd all fit <laughs> just in this one room. <laughs> uh, hopefully, it, um, hopefully it's a lot better now. It's hard to say. It's got to be better got to be just with the, the spread of information on the internet and there are some popular anarchist channels on youtube and other places so you got to think it's better than it ever has been yeah the ability to get information out is is much better but of course now they're ta- uh, they're attacking uh, i'll use that word a little bit loosely they're disparaging people who aren't part of the mainstream media and calling them fake news so if you're not an established media presence, you know, as of whatever arbitrary point, then they're going to immediately deem whatever you say as illegitimate. And it's because or, the transfer of information you get on the is so SPLT. readily available. I'm sorry, what did you say? It's because the, the transfer of information is now so readily available, like it's so much easier to right. get your message out, that right. they have to talk shit about anything that differs from that 3 by 5 card of opinion. Right. Irregardless of whether it's true or not, which is kind of ridiculous. Like, if, if the pursuit of truth is, like, what is actually true, then they're obviously aware that they don't have a leg to stand on. I mean, if anyone's an expert in fake news, it is the mainstream media. Yeah. And they'll listen to outlets like uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, who, who, who will slander anybody as a hate group that just even slightly suggests any kind of change to government. It's uh it's a world we live in. The Ministry of Truth is in full effect. And we hope to be an antidote to that. So if, if you do listen, uh stay tuned. We have lots more to talk about in uh coming episodes. We will start getting into movies starting with the next episode. And we will showcase instances of actual anarchy from a perspective of actual anarchy. That's right. And if you are an anarchist and you disagree with us, come at us, bro. I would love to talk to a real-life Marxist or Maoist or Leninist or any one of you people that have these really funny beliefs, at least in my view, uh, you know, that we don't, we don't, we can't have property (laughs) or we can have personal property, but not other regular property. And what the difference is between that and how you distinguish that and who makes the rules as to why, what is what and it's all very vague. And how's that in property is theft? Then how, how are they always typing it on the internet on their computers? Yeah, and if they don't own themselves, then how are they permitted to type it on their computers? Yeah, do they get the, the, get the, get the uh, permission of everybody else on the planet first? Because I don't remember giving my consent to allow them to type it on the... I would have if they had asked me, but I don't remember doing it. Yeah, no one asked me. Yeah. And I didn't ask anyone to be able to put the show together. I mean, other than you. You were okay with it, so here we are. I did consent. Although I didn't consent to my image. You claim I consented, but I don't remember it. Being on the internet, on the YouTubes. But fine, it's fine. Getting out there, put me out there, I'll put myself out there, and I'll put out. Well, your face will be present on the uh, inside back cover of your book when it's finally published, right? You better believe it. Yeah, well, there you go. Your ugly mug will be on there. Yeah. It's inescapable. Unless I put my fox on there instead. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. So, um, we run the Actual Anarchy podcast. This is the very first inaugural episode. We are going to ponder on whether we're going to do response videos because those seem to get a lot of traction on the YouTube. And uh, many of the ones that we admire have little cartoony uh, avatar type characters. And so we decided to have a fox and a wolf be our characters. So look out for those. And they'll be, you know, probably short five, ten minute videos if we, if we end up doing it. It's not a for sure thing yet. Uh, but Robert is working on artwork for that now. He's a bit of an artist and a bit of an author and a bit of an anarchist. So, you know, he's like a triple threat, ladies. Look out. <laughs> yeah. 
So look forward to that if you're interested. Uh, or don't. Live your life, man. We're anarchists. In a good way. Good way of anarchists. Hey, what are you, what, are you assuming that it's not a good way? Well, I'm saying that the prevailing opinion is probably not in a good way. So I'm reiterating good way. Okay. Well, I think we should assume it's always meant in a good way because we mean it always in a good way and we are all about the good way. And we'll tell you what isn't anarchy, like government, anytime you're using force and coercion, fucking Mad Max, that bullshit. Good movie, but it's it's not it's not anarchy. So anyway, we'll we'll get into it later. Yeah, so this was just uh, the very first episode, just trying to give you uh, a layout of who we are and, and what we do, how we do it, and a little bit of why. And now it's time to tell you the when. Uh, we plan to post once a week. Uh, previously, we had been posting every Friday. Uh, Robert, is that still good for you? I can shift around uh, what we do for Read Rothbard Podcast, or you and I can choose a different time and date for this podcast. Yeah, um, I live in a cabin down by the river, so it's uh, anytime is taco time. All right, well, then we may, uh, we will be at least once a week, and with the occasional special, anytime there's a holiday or some kind of um, event happening, like inauguration or the Olympics, uh, we've been doing specials, uh, or like Christmas and Thanksgiving, things like that. So look for uh, one plus episode per week on average. And uh, it'll be the Actual Anarchy podcast. We will soon be launching the website actualanarchy.com. Uh, I will be launching later today the Facebook page, facebook.com slash actualanarchy. We do have a YouTube, which is YouTube, search for Actual Anarchy channel. And then um, in the meantime, we're going to continue to post things to readrothbard.com. There's a bunch of links for supporting us. Uh, there's Amazon, there's readitfor.me, there's Liberty Classroom, there's a tip jar page, links to our Patreon. And essentially, we're going to come out, come out at the end with uh, a series of properties that all roll up into a thing called the Libertarian Union. So it'll be libertarianunion.com. Beneath that will be actualanarchy.com, readrothbar.com. And then there's also going to be three podcasts. So Reed Rothbard Podcast, which is audiobooks, Enemy of the State, which is lectures by Murray Rothbard, both of those. And then the third podcast is this one, the actual Anarchy Podcast, where Robert and I talk about movies from an anarcho-capitalist libertarian perspective with an eye towards Austrian economics. Snap. Crackle. And pop. Yeah, so like your mom told you when you were two years old, it's wrong to hit people. Peace. The Chipmunks. C-H-I-P-M-U-N-K. We're the Chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do 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 do